All right, welcome everyone to, the, to today's Brown Bag webinar series. I'm just gonna give a, uh, about 10 more seconds to let people enter the room and we will get started. Thank you for being here today. Okay, um, my name is Melissa Gray. I am the Senior Program Manager with the National Aging and Disability Transportation Center. And I am delighted to welcome everyone uh, to today's Brown Back webinar series featuring Greater Portland Council of Governments. Uh, we've got exciting short 30 minutes uh, with, with everyone today. So I'm glad that you're here today. Just a few housekeeping uh, logistics. Um, as you all uh, can um, know that you will be in listen only mode during today's webinar. Um, the webinar is being recorded and we will send out uh, the recording along with the presentation slides uh, following the webinar. You should expect to get that at least before the end of, end of the week, um, no later than Monday. Um, you can submit questions and we welcome questions in the Q&A box throughout the presentation. So if there's something that you wanna ask um, during our uh, formal Q&A time, please insert those questions in the Q&A box. You'll find that at the bottom of your screen. Or if you are just on the phone and not in the webinar room, you can email your questions to H-E-D-M-O-N-D-S at N4A.org, that's Heather Edmonds. And we also recommend that you connect to your computer audio um, as we're gonna show a short video um, and that's probably the best way to be able to hear the video. Um, our webinar agenda, I'll just quickly uh, go over that. Um, again, welcome um, and um, I'll go ahead and introduce our speaker, uh, Zoe Miller. She's the Director of Communi Community Engagement with the Greater Portland Council of Go Governments. She will speak immediately following our Transportation Innovations Across America video, which features um, their ShopperLinks program, um, the NADTC 2019 grant. And um, we will have a short amount of time afterwards for some questions and answers. So I will go ahead and get that video queued up. Portland, Maine is a booming port and tourist center, but in South Portland, access to transportation is limited. The Greater Portland Council of Governments is testing a citywide shopper shuttle to help with grocery shopping and access to food banks. There's a lot of transportation issues here. Maine is cold, and when you get to the bus stops, um, there's no shelter except at the downtown one. But then people live a good distance from the bus stop. So if you're fairly healthy, you could walk three or four blocks to the bus stop and think nothing of it. But if you're getting frail and you have some disabilities, it might be hard to do that walk in the summer, but then put some ice on the sidewalk and then it becomes treacherous. We're one of the oldest states in the nation and we have a rural population that's fairly dispersed. So the big question that we have is as people either age out of being able to drive or don't have the resources to be able to maintain their own automobile, how do we get them around? This grant has been really important for us to experiment with how to reach the senior population and help them reach food. A 2018 National Aging and Disability Transportation Center poll found that older adults and people with disabilities have difficulty finding transportation in their communities. This is due to a lack of affordable and accessible transportation options. To address this issue and to help identify innovative solutions that could be used in other parts of the country, NADTC awarded a grant to the Greater Portland Council of Governments. The challenge to help older adults and people with disabilities who no longer or cannot drive get around to help them get to the grocery store, to medical appointments, and wherever else they may want or need to go. With the support provided by NADTC funding, the Greater Portland Council of Governments is working with local food banks, reaching out to populations of older adults and people with disabilities, 
and testing a citywide weekly shopper shuttle service to try to solve the problem. What we've been able to do with this funding is to try that out and say, how does it actually work for older adults to, who don't have smartphones to try using on-demand rides? Does it work? Will they be interested in it? I think we have found with the shopper shuttle that that seems to be a way to provide rides efficiently and that if you can get a number of people using it all at the same time, that you could get the cost to be, you know, fairly low per person. I guess the biggest lesson I've learned is that the need is greater than I thought it was. So to see that people are really out there that are struggling and that need food and fresh fruit and vegetables and the food pantry, I think is great. It's so hard to get there. You know, it's kind of off the beaten path. The Portland Food Cupboard is working hard to make transportation and food accessible to older adults and people with disabilities. The weekly shopper shuttle service helps. We are not on a bus line right now, so that makes it difficult. Some people cannot get here, and that, that's a problem. Becky Johnson's son is autistic. For a special needs child, waiting at a bus stop that runs only every two hours is difficult and often unrealistic. With Becky's limited income, a ride service used by Greater Portland Council of Governments to connect people who do not have smartphones with rideshare services is a huge help. Without being able to depend on this service, families like mine wouldn't be able to have access to basic needs like food, personal necessities, and just basic things we need for our home. If you don't have mobility, you can't get your food. You can't get your health care, and you can't have sociability. And so that's not really meeting your quality of life needs. So mobility is key to being able to successfully stay at home and to be healthy mentally and physically. To work with NADTC and have an ongoing dialogue about how we do this, you know, we're excited to do this on the ground work because we can then inform conversations about policy and about future funding so that we can move more quickly to solutions for people. Thanks to NADTC funding, the Greater Portland Council of Governments has achieved success and learned valuable lessons along the way by testing a variety of ways to help older adults and people with disabilities get where they want and need to go. The goal? to help other communities across America implement similar transportation innovations. Okay, um, the floor is now yours, Zoe. Thank you so much. Hi there. Um, thank you so much to NADTC for inviting me to speak about our work um, on advancing mobility with inclusive planning and our Shopper Links project. Um, as uh, Melissa mentioned, we were um, a grantee of NADTC, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we um, do our work overall. I wanted to start off with just saying a word about our organization. The Greater Portland Council of Governments is the Regional Planning Council for 25 cities and towns in Southern Maine. We're in the most populated part of the state. We have rural, suburban, and urban communities. And GPCOG is also home to the region's federally mandated Metropolitan Planning Organization. And so we um, work with cities and towns to make decisions about millions of dollars in transportation investments. And our agency really plays a role in convening, coordinating, and um, catalyzing projects and initiatives throughout the region. We, um, we began doing inclusive transportation work in 2017. Uh, we had uh, initially, uh, an assessment project that was funded through the National Center for Mobility Management, another center of FTA. And we were able to bring together a number of different stakeholders to think about what 
barriers were in the region for um, especially for older adults, people with disabilities and people of color. And we also were able to kick off a volunteer role called the Mobility Liaison. And we have two of our Mobility Liaisons pictured on this slide, Karen Perry and Mary Cabongo, as a way to bring people with lived experience to the table. Um, we really wanted, we wanted to emphasize that in addition to having the many different non-transportation agencies that are affected by transportation um, at the table with transportation providers. We needed to have the people who depend on public transportation, who know it best and who are really experts in, in their own experiences at the table. So we created this position where we provide a stipend, a title, some support for travel. And um, Mireille and Karen have been working with us now for, um, about three years. We also um, were very excited to, you know, look at how we could create systemic approaches to actively and consistently include older adults, people with disabilities, and other underrepresented communities, not just in planning transportation, um, but also in the decision-making process. And so we jumped into that work with um, funding that came to us through both NADTC and um, the Transit Planning for All initiative. Um, with that project, we were able to focus first on really hearing from the community and hearing from people with lived experience. Um, we assembled a steering committee that included 19 older adults and people with disabilities, um, along with some stakeholders who uh, from partner organizations who work with both of those communities. And we um, worked together to put on a series of focus groups to do a workshop and to also do a survey. And we then, for the NADTC portion of the project, we re this resulted in a framework for a ready to launch, to launch solution, the Shopper Links pilot. We also, through this research, we identified ways that the agency could on an ongoing basis be supporting more inclusive planning projects. Um, so when we, when we then applied for a second round of funding from NADTC, we were fortunate to receive that funding. And we jumped in um, and actually we, you know, we decided what part of what led us to pick um, focus on, fo focusing on um, a shopper rides to grocery stores was um, what that we heard very clearly through our focus group conversations and the survey that this was a need in the community and that people struggled with you know the limits on what you can carry on a bus um, with you know incomplete sidewalk and and um, road crossing connections and really you know that people were going without with going going without groceries because they didn't want to burden a, f a friend or a family member with providing a ride when they'd already asked them. So we jumped in with our Shopper Links pilot to test out two ways to provide rides to food outlets. And we focused, we decided to focus in on one particular city in our region, South Portland, which is um, rather, um, large in its geography and has, um, you know, has a very um, kind of a range of areas where there are folks who are either living in um, lower income settings where there are, you know, their, their roadways and their streets to connect to grocery stores are not that great. And then also a lot of older adults and people with disabilities who are living out in the community. And we looked at how to connect them to their food outlets. So both the grocery store and the local um, food pantry, which the local food pantry happens to not be on any bus, you know, it's, it's quite a ways off the bus line. And we did this with both a shopper shuttle and a, um, using a service called GoGo -Go Grandparent that enables people to access um, Uber and Lyft rides without a smartphone. And so you can just call up with, with a, you know, from a landline or from a, you know, a non-smartphone and order a ride. Um, we found through this process that um, 
you know, we, we, we learned a lot about, you know, how does technology work for these audiences and how does, you know, how, how do you um, address some of the needs for flexibility that people are really looking for? Um, but I think some of the things we learned through the work, um, despite, you know, it not taking off the way we wanted it to have been really valuable. And I think, you know, one sort of key piece was that we really, um, we didn't provide ourselves with enough time. Our pilot lasted um, I, about three months, the actual service, at the time that the service was being offered. And so what we heard from people who signed up and maybe didn't use it or from people who, who hadn't signed up was that they didn't, they worried that they didn't want to change what they were already doing that worked to try something that wasn't proven um, or they didn't know if it would last. Um, we also heard that even with our attempt to streamline the registration process that it was still a bit complicated for people and, um, and that really speaks to the need in our community to better coordinate transportation overall. Um, we heard pretty loud and clear from older adults that on-demand rides are still intimidating. Getting into a car with a stranger, you know, doesn't really work for a lot of folks. Um, and finally, you know, we found that the, the, the schedule, you know, that we were offering um, just still wasn't working for enough people. And so having some kind of, for the folks who preferred the shuttle, having more flexible scheduling would have, would have been much preferred. Um, out of this work though, we really, um, we're really pleased with the level of inclusiveness of the, of the project planning and implementation. We had several older adults and people with disabilities who were part of the team that designed and implemented the project and continue to be involved with the work. Um, we also made some really important contacts within the community and um, built a stronger partnership with our house, housing agencies and our agency on aging. Um, we have gone on from that project to continue to really deepen our inclusive planning work um, and you know, learning that we, I think we've got further to go in our community around um, co improving coordination among providers and perhaps, you know, the, the really pushing for more, um, more fixed route transit that just has more, that, that provides longer coverage. Um, and some of what our, you know, city councilor who was in the video talked about, about having more amenities for people who are using that service. Um, we did develop a couple of tools that I wanted to share. Um, one um, on the right, that's Derek O'Brien, who's one of our community transportation leaders. We've created a training program to get people with lived experience to be speaking directly to decision makers. We graduated 23 people in that program last year, and they are, they are now working on action plans um, to implement programs. And, and in one case, um, and implement changes in the community, in one case, one of our um, leaders is, is focused on better on-demand rides in the greater Portland area for people who depend on them. So for people who use ADA paratransit. Um, and I think we've really started to move the needle on in advancing inclusive decision making. So that, again, these are many of our um, community transportation leaders. And we actually have our board is going to be creating seats on the, on the governing body for community transportation leaders to be at the table in making decisions about transportation investments. Um, and I think that, you know, we really, through this work, we found that planning inclusively, you may not always get the outcome that you were hoping for, but I believe you get, you, you will eventually get better outcomes because of having that, having folks at the table, having people at the table who are the most impacted by, by the transportation challenges in the community. For us, we've found that we've started to build inclusive planning into every project and that we're able, we've been able to leverage some of our um, federal transit money, some of our federal highway money to now do our work more inclusively. And on the left here, we have 
um, Patty and Sue, who are two of our community transportation leaders who are really focused on um, making sure that older adults know how to access the, the system that we have. Um, that is the end of my slides here, but I'm happy to answer questions if folks have any. Okay, so if you have any questions, feel free to in insert those in the Q&A uh, function. Um, I do have one question, Zoe. Um, so what would you say one of your uh, biggest challenges uh, was in um, both the planning and implementation process. I know that the implementation built on upon the planning process, but if you could pull out maybe one of one of the biggest either challenges or barriers that that your program faced in um, planning and implementing um, implementing the program. So, so the ch sorry, just the challenge biggest challenges that we faced in implementing mm -hmm. the program. Mm hmm. Yeah, so I mean, I think that we, what stands out to me is the challenge of having people adopt something different. So even though we had had a lot of input about the need for this and we felt very confident going into it that we were addressing the need, if I had it to do over, I would in insert another phase of doing really some like beta testing with the audience that we were working with. Um, because I think that there, there's such a challenge in, in knowing will the solution that you're, that, you, that you're trying to implement, will it be successful? And so, I mean, I think doing a deeper dive into how well would the registration work for people and how might they find you know, I think in retrospect, thinking, um, thinking we had made it simple, but I think spending even more time getting direct feedback from people about it to, to figure out, does it really work well for them? Okay. Um, we've got so a few questions coming into the uh, Q&A. Uh, first question, in regard to the shopper shuttle, does the shuttle wait and were people concerned about how many stops uh, about many stops before they got to the store. Also, how did you go about pricing? Yeah, so we did, um, we focused on, we tried to reduce the amount of time that people would need to spend on the shuttle and, um, you know, so they weren't going to be like driving around the city for a couple of hours by focusing on zones. And so kind of dividing the city up into two zones so that any given person would only need to be on the shuttle for, you know, say about 20 minutes. Um, we did um, allow people time to, you know, so we, we gave people a, an hour pickup window and allowed time once um, the driver arrived at at their home to, to, you know, get out the door and get into the shuttle. And often, you know, the driver would, could give people a hand if that was needed. Um, what was the, uh, oh, how did we go about pricing? Pricing, we, yes. Yeah, we opted to make it free. Um, we, there was um, quite a bit of um, discussion of how to handle this and whether it made sense. Um, we, what we wanted to do was, um, I think we, you know, we wanted to demonstrate the success and get people to try it. And the decision was that for the amount of administration that would, administrative work that would go into processing payments, the benefit would be the, the, you know, the cash in the, in the fare box would really kind of, it would sort of be a wash. Um, so we opted to go that route. Thanks. Uh, another question. Um, um, how many unique riders uh, do you have? Um, you did also, you just addressed the cost per ride. Um, and then what does, what did it cost the, the transportation provider? So I'm assuming um, you all who provided the service. Um, but um, that was a question just about how many unique riders did you uh, typically have? Yeah, you know, we really, we did not have that many. We, um, I think we had 43 people who ended up registering 
for the service. And then I believe we had 17 who used it. Um, I don't have the information off the top of my head on the cost per ride um, because I think originally the, the thought was if we were able to have 15 riders per trip that it would cost around um, $20 per rider. But then, you know, clearly that we didn't fill the vans. Um, so, um, so the cost ended up being higher. I would be happy to follow up if, if folks were interested in, in our cost, you know, that kind of cost analysis. Um, with the GoGo grandparent rides, the you know those were priced pretty closely to what you would see for an uber or lyft ride if you're just looking if you're looking at what they cost in your community with um an additional per minute cost that for us the attractiveness of that was that it paid for the customer service um so i believe it was um at that time it was like 25 cents extra per minute um I think, you know, I've talked to folks in other parts of the country who've done similar projects and use things like, you know, Uber Health or Lyft Concierge and are able to provide their own customer service and then bring down the cost of the rides. So then it's just the, it's just the market cost for the rides. Thank you. Um, another question, were FTA Section 5310 funds used to support this new service? Um, we used only the funds we received through NADTC that that so they are FTA funds, but remind me, Melissa, I don't think they are 5310 funds. Um, no. Okay. They are not. Okay. So are you still there, Dalijou? Oh, no, I'm still here. Oh, okay. Um, another question, um, and uh, some of these may have been answered and we we're almost right at the top of the hour. Uh, here's um, someone asked how did community members register for your program and do you plan on making the program permanent? Yeah, so, well, we had um, several ways that community members could register. We partnered with the social services division so they could register right at the office with the social services director. We had several community partners who, you know, one of them um, staffs a community hub in one of the um, neighborhoods that has the highest level of poverty. And so folks could walk into her office and, and register with her. They could also register online um, or by calling. Um, and we, the program has not, is not continuing right now, but we are looking at doing something similar, but doing, uh, you know, ha having more of a kind of prototyping phase. Um, I think we, you know, as I said earlier, it really takes a long time to get the word out. So I'm not convinced that people wouldn't have used this more if we, you know, say we had had two years to stretch it out and see, to see if it would take off. Um, so what, what we're in conversations right now with some of our larger bus agencies about doing something along these lines, um, but doing, building in more of that prototyping that I mentioned with, with riders. Okay. And uh, we've got still quite a few questions, but I'm gonna ask one final question and then I will ask, I don't know, Zoe, if you have a contact slide on the, at the end of the, your slideshow. If not, um, we'll, we'll make sure that she adds one before I send the slides out so that those whose questions were not asked today, uh, you can definitely follow up Zoe uh, directly. Uh, but the last question I will ask is, um, what, um, how has your outreach changed in a COVID world has your ridership increased or decreased during the pandemic? Yeah, so that's actually something that I'm glad that I got asked this because I can mention that our agency just um, is about to put out a white paper we, cr we developed on inclusive and accessible virtual engagement because absolutely our engagement has changed so much. Um, we've continued to meet with our community transportation leaders and we do that over Zoom and always off, always making sure people know how to call in if, if they don't, if they're not able to join um, on the online interface. 
but it, you know, it certainly changes as we gear up for some other big pro projects in the region. We're wondering, you know, what will it look like to reach the people we aren't already connected with? Um, so that white paper uh, will be on our website in um, definitely by the end of the month and maybe I, and we can link it to NADTC for sure as well. And I think it provides it's it provides some helpful insights. There's some case studies in there of how organizations are doing their work differently. Um, and and overall, I mean, as I said earlier, we're not this service, this specific service hasn't been continuing to run. We did have our largest bus agencies continued to run throughout, you know, basically never stopped running um, and went uh, over to um, free fare for riders. And I, I think what we've seen is the people who need to use public transportation, who depend, depend on it for the most part have continued to ride. Um, Although I, I know, I'm sure it's not a surprise to a lot of folks that for many of the older adults, they are just not, they're doing their best to not go out because they are in a higher risk category. So um, I think we're seeing, we're seeing like pretty um, low ridership, but the hope is that we can, um, you know, continue to provide, as a region, continue to provide services for those who really need it and build it up in the, you know, coming months. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Zoe, for your time. And I want to thank everyone who participated this afternoon. Um, as I mentioned, we still have a, a several questions in the, in, in the Q&A box. And so I'll make sure that I get these questions to Zoe and um, if she can answer those. And I, and I can provide those responses whenever we send out the recording um, and her slides. And we'll make sure she has her contact information attached to that. But once again, want to respect everyone's time. We are right after the top of the hour. Our next Brown Back webinar will be on Thursday, September the 10th. And uh, registration will open for that next week. So hope to see you at that time. Uh, everyone have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.